chapter 12, verse 18 through 25. The book of Hebrews tells us that God loves coffee. The name Hebrews. <laughs> We've uh, kind of been hopping and skipping through the book over the past couple of months. And, and uh, we talked about uh, running the great race, running a, 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 running a great race. In chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 4, we look at kind of the discipline, a warning against rejecting God's grace. And now today I want to give you kind of an, an instruction to uh, try to maintain an understanding uh, the breadth and the width and the awesomeness of God and His grace uh, in our relationship with Him. And uh, so we're going to be looking at verses, uh, to begin with, verses 18 through 24, and then later, verse 25, we're going to look at a passage in Ezekiel, and then uh, have a kind of look at towards the end of, uh, the, of chapter 12, uh, if we get that far um, today. Uh, the good news about, if you, if you preach for 30 years, you, you, you can see when it gets to 12, 15, and everybody's dying. That you know, this suddenly this sermon became a two-part series. It just says, "Hang on." So, uh, so on that. But uh, so we want to think about this. And the old saying is, "Familiarity breeds contempt." You ever heard that? And what what that means is, I get so familiar with something that I kind of lose respect for it, or or maybe I lose the uh, sight of the value. I think a lot of times in in relationships that we get so familiar uh, with one another that we forget the shock and the awe that, oh my gosh, she actually said she'd go out with me. Mm -hmm. You know? We, we kind of lose that, that, that kind of that wonder uh, of it. And, and, and so sometimes we have to go back and, and reevaluate and, and, and recalibrate and, and get back on board with that and, and see, uh, uh, see the, the value and the wonder of it all. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, we are blessed with such an overwhelming gift of grace that if we don't be vigilant, we can lose sight about how much God has done for us and how much uh, Christ endured so that our sins could be forgiven. And we can also lose sight of what a mighty and powerful thing it is that the God of all creation would, would deign to wipe away all my transgressions. And that should impact how I live and, and what I desire and how I push forward and how I deal with others. And it should impact me at my very core. And, and so one of the things that I, I uh, have been, uh, been thinking of as I've been studying this scripture and looking at it for two weeks and and, and sometimes sermons just flow onto a page, and sometimes sermons are like Jacob struggling with the angel uh, and saying, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And, and I still might be waiting for that, you know, on this passage. But, but you know, you, 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 uh, I've become aware of the fact that I think the church has become so enamored with God's grace that we take it for granted and we don't see the value and, and we cheapen it a little bit or we cheapen it a lot of bit. and so we're going to look at that and, and uh, we want to talk about taking the terror out but re, uh, uh, keeping the awe and so in verse uh, 18 through uh, 24 it says for you have not come to what could not be or what could be touched, to a blazing fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to the blast of the trumpet and the sound of words. Now, uh, the author of Hebrews is going back to that time in the book of Exodus where Moses led the people to the holy mountain. He said, listen, I'm going to, God's going to lead you out of Egypt. We're going to his holy mountain, and we're going to worship God at this holy mountain, and he's going to speak to you. It's going to be awesome. And they were all on board till they got there, and it was cloud and smoke, and it was like the sound of 
thunder and lightning and trumpets, and it was just the, the, the holiness and the power of God was so evident that they were terrified. And they said, hey, don't touch it, because if an unclean thing touches it, it'll die. And so uh, he's referring to that, and he says, listen, you didn't come to that. That was not your encounter with Christ. I'm going to guess that your encounter with Christ, when you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there was no smoke, fire, gloom, doom, trumpet blast, scare the bejeebies out of you. Or maybe there was. But, he goes, listen, you didn't come to a terrifying thing. When they came to the mountain of God, it was a terrifying thing. It says, those who heard it begged that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not bear what was commanded. And if even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. And the appearance, the appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I am terrified and trembling. If you go back and read that, you know what the people of Israel said? Hey, Moses, you go up to the mountain, and if you come back, We'll give you a listen. But I ain't going up there. They were terrified. And so he said, listen, that's not what you came to. You didn't come to that, that terrifying presence, that wrath of God presence. Instead, you came to grace. Go to the next slide. And so the wonder of God's grace, and what we want to compare then in this. Oh, man, I left out part of that scripture. Okay. All right, so uh, instead, and I'm going to read verses 22 through 24 to you. Instead, you come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels in festive gathering. So we see, first of all, we see what they encountered in the Old Testament, the mountain of fire. But when you came, you came to the Jerusalem, the, the Mount Zion, the city of the living God, with myriads of angels in festive gathering to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to God who is the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which says better things than the blood of Abel. And so now as you look at that, you, you look at the terror of the law versus the atonement of grace in the new covenant. So you didn't go to that holy mountain where you were terrified to stand before God. Now, because of the grace of God, because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we're able to be at peace with God, and we're able to come to him, not as those fearing for our lives, but those coming to a father for care, for need, for supplication, for direction and guidance. Your relationship with the God of the New Covenant is much different than the relationship of, of the Old Testament where they had, you know, if you touch the mountain, you could die. You know, if you're unclean and you come to the Holy of Holies, you could die. Uh, you think about uh, uh, when uh, David tried to move the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem and instead of doing it the way God said to do it, have the priest carry it on a pole, he put it on a new cart with an ox. And it says the ox stumbled because it wasn't designed to be carried that way. It was clumsy. It didn't work. And when it started to topple over, one of the men reached up to, to hold it up. And as soon as he touched it, he died. My battery went out on my microphone right then. Look at that. Okay. I'm going to have to talk loud to the people on Facebook for the rest of the day. Here we go. So... Uh, as you look at that, you, you think of this, you know, there was a terrifying thing to mishandle those things. And, uh, and, and so, uh, we don't come in that terror. We come through the atonement of grace in the new covenant. The danger, though, is uh, of the new covenant is that when we remove the terror, we can mistakenly remove the reverence, the awe, or the respect. Now what that means is, I don't have to be terrified of God. But I do need to have an awesome respect and reverence for God. That I need to be awestruck by his presence and his purpose and who he is. And so we can lose the terror, but we cannot lose the awe. And we can't become irreverent in our faith. 
And so that's one of the things that we as the New Testament church can struggle with. We can get so far into the realm of grace that we take it for granted and we turn it into a license. That now my actions don't matter, my attitudes don't matter, I'm saved by grace, so what does it matter? Well, the New Testament is filled with the teachings of Jesus saying, this is how they're going to know that you love me and that you're my disciples. You do what I've commanded you to do. All right? That you keep my commands. And so we, we see that continually. We're, we're uh, compelled in the New Testament to, to follow the teachings, to be transformed, to keep the word of God, to follow Jesus, to honor him uh, in that. And so as we, we think about that, we need to not lose the reverence, the awe, or the respect. We cannot allow grace to turn into a license. Now go to the next slide. This should be the first. Oh, that's the verses I wanted before. Go to the next one. <laughs> with what happens on the page doesn't match up with what happens on the screen. Look what he says. Make sure that you do not reject the one who speaks. For if they did not escape when they rejected him who warned them on earth, even less will we turn away from him. So even less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven. Now understand this is that as we do that, as we separate the terror from the reverence, I'm not terrified of God, but I stand in holy reverence and in awe of God. Listen, understand that it's going to be much worse for those who reject the God who calls them from heaven than for those who break the covenant of the Old Testament. And so he says, listen, you need to have that respect, that reverence, that awe. It is an awesome thing that the God of all creation forgives all your sin. Amen. It is an incredibly awesome thing. I should be humble. Listen, if you know me, I should be humiliated. And, and, and by the unfathomable thing that God loved me enough to forgive my sins and for me to inherit his holy heaven. That I'm no longer an enemy of God, but I'm joint heirs with Christ. That I don't have to tremble in fear at the God on a smoky mountain, but now I can cry, Abba, Father. Papa. That I can come to him and that. that. And, and so, that on the one side, we don't want to say, well, I've got to earn my way into heaven because we can't do that. But we also don't want to take a license and say, well, it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter who I am. I'm saved and so good for me. I'll see you when we get there. No, we still live in that covenant. We have that respect. We have that awe. We have that reverence. But it's done by the grace of God. And, but we need to have a reverence for the grace of God. A reverence for the grace of God. Now, my father was one of the kindest men you'll ever want to meet. He, I mean, he was a wonderful, kind man. But some of my buddies in high school were terrified of him. They'd come into the house. He'd be sitting in this rocking chair with his... Bible down on his knees and his bifocals down like this. And he'd look up and acknowledge them. And and I had a friend that came to me and says, you know, your man, your dad was one of the nicest, one most wonderful men I ever met, but he always terrified me. I said, well, why? He goes, he'd be reading his Bible and he'd look over his glasses, and I thought, that man can see every horrible thought and deed I've ever done. <laughs> Well, I kind of know the feeling. <laughs> right? And there was a time when, you know, I can remember as a little kid, if my dad rose, raised his voice, it was, oh. But then it, you know, I never was afraid of him, but, but I had a reverence and respect. And there's a lot of things in life that I go, man, I, I want to honor his legacy. I want to honor his name. I, I, I still want to do that. Uh, I, there are certain times when we do things, and I think, you know, Dad would like this. This would be fun. You know, that kind of thing. And, and you know, that, that's just part of that relationship. 
we ought to have that kind of relationship with our, our Heavenly Father. You know what? I don't want to, uh, it, you know, I don't want to be free from sin, not because I'm afraid of my God. I want to be done with this because I love my God. And I want to please my God. Uh, and, and I want to live uh, in the, the powerful blessings of being at peace with him. I want to be able to go to sleep at night being at peace with God because I'm living for him. I'm in relationship with him. And I'm allowing him to work in me and to work through me. It's not out of fear from the holy mountain. It's out of reverence, respect, awe, and love. Doesn't that sound more like a, a healthy relationship? And let's face it, the healthier your relationship with God is, the more you're able to expect, experience his blessing, his peace, his direction, his guidance, his love. And, and so we look at that. He says, don't reject the one who speaks. There's no escape if you do. Go to, uh, we're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 59 through 63. This is what the Lord says. I will deal with you. According to what you have done, since you've despised the oath by breaking the covenant. Now, this is during the exile. Ezekiel is a prophet of, uh, of uh, Jerusalem, but he prophesies from Babylon. And the first group of people that are taken out of Jerusalem to Babylon into exile, he's part of that. So the book of Ezekiel is written uh, from Susa. Uh, in the Babylonian Empire. Okay? And so now he's talking about Jerusalem, which is getting ready to fall. And he says, this is what the Lord says, I will deal with you according to what you have done since you've despised the oath by breaking the covenant. But I will remember the covenant I made with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Now he says, listen, this is a terrifying thing to think that God would deal with us according to what we have done. I'm going to deal with you based solely on what you've done. I'm just going to tell you, that is not a covenant that I want to enter into. Because I can't live up to it. But look what he says. After that, I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Go to the next slide. I will establish my covenant with you, and you will know that I am Yahweh. Now, I want you to read this next phrase and see if that doesn't make you happier. So, when I make atonement for all you have done. See, there's the difference. In the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, I will deal with you according to what you've done by the law. Well, we can't live up to the law. All right. Now there are those today that would say, oh, but you've got to keep the law, you've got to keep the law. You know what? I want to live by God's word and God's will. But my salvation is not contingent on my perfected, uh, perfect, uh, perfect legalistic lifestyle. I don't have to eat the right things. I don't have to face the right direction to pray. I know you know what? I just relate to God. I love God and I try to love others. All right? I mean, that, that's where we're at on that. And so he says, listen, I, when I make atonement for all that you have done, you and I are saved by grace because God made atonement for all that we've done through the blood of Jesus Christ. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And look, he says, you'll remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth again because of your disgrace. This is the de declaration of the Lord God. Now, look what he says. I make atonement, but you know what? You're not going to open your mouth in defiance. There's going to be a shame to that sinful lifestyle. Now, what that means is, go to the next one. We do remember our shame, and we glory in the forgiveness of God's grace. All right? And now, what that means is this. We all have a conversion story, a transformation story, correct? And we can look back on those things in our lives that God has delivered us out of, delivered us through, delivered us from. 
And, and many times, you know, uh, I, I treat my life as a song, uh, as a blues song. The hard times in life, there's no mystery to it. I knew better. I just chose not to do it. Right? And, and so we can look back and, but you know what? Rather than glory in the shame of our past, we're ashamed of that. That is to our shame. We remember that. So that we have a launching point to recognize the beauty and the glory and the power of grace. Now, do I beat myself up over my life before Christ? I try not to dwell on that. However, I do need to have that as my starting point so I can see the benefits and the glory of that. I need to remember that I have a relationship with God not because I earned it, not because I'm valuable or wonderful, but because God loved me and gave his life and my, and Jesus gave his life on, on my behalf. He shed his blood for us. Right? And so I have a relationship with God because I have been forgiven of that past. It's good to know that starting point so we can see what God has done. Because we don't want to just think of it as, well, I'm in a relationship with God, it's all hunky dory, everything's good, and so it doesn't matter. No, what, how I live matters. I need to honor God with the way that I live. Now, am I going to foul that up? I thought I'd get a bigger amen than that. <laughs> I thought we'd be having people wind up, listen, I can testify, Pastor, I can testify, right? 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 Yeah. But, okay, I am. But I remain in God's grace and his forgiveness on that. However, I recognize this is not how I want to live. That's not who I want to be. I want to be right with God. And so we remain, we maintain a holy reverence for God and godliness. And we recognize the glory of our atonement. And also we recognize and receive the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. He's made atonement for all that we've done. Now, do we have that shame of the past? We do remember the shame of the past, but we only remember the shame of the past so that we can frame the context of the glory of God. I find it interesting if you read in the book of Acts that a couple of decades down the road, when Paul gets a chance to speak to the big guys, the Roman leaders. And he goes back and he goes, you know where he starts? He starts with his conversion. Yeah, I get what you're saying about this Jesus thing. I used to kill people over it. I didn't do the dirty work. I just held the coat, but I was there cheering them on. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and he goes through and he says, listen, here's where I was. And that is my launching pad into glory. And that starting point on that. And so he, he stands before Agrippa, and Agrippa says, man, you almost have me convinced to be a Christian. Of course, Agrippa's in, but then I'd lose all my perks and all the good, all the fun stuff. Right? But where do you go back to? He went back to that point of shame so that he could frame the context of God's glory. How many of you have scars? 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 Yeah. <laughs> I'm perfect. I don't know. <laughs> uh, on one of my thumbs, or it's kind of, I've worn it off a little bit. Oh, I used to have a scar that went straight across. No. I had a saw, and I was trying to saw a board. <laughs> and I was holding it, I was holding it, and then the, it came out of the wood, and it went right across that thumb. And so for years and years, you can see it's kind of worn out. I've gotten old. Uh, you can't see it with all the other wrinkles in there, right? And, or maybe I wore it off on a guitar. Who knows? But there you go. That was a skull. You know, uh, 
But what is, what is that scar a reminder of? A wound? A pain? A healing. A healing. Not paying attention. Not paying attention. Brother, that is my life story right there, man. You know, but you think about that. That scar can represent, oh, man, I messed up. It can represent pain. It, you know, it can be an injury that someone caused me. It could be healing. That, you know, I've got one. I got a little hernia scar right in here, and, and uh, you know, it looks like a little accordion kind of thing. And, uh, you know, my dad, I remember back in the day, he had a, a quadruple bypass in 1983. So that's back when they did the rib spreaders and rig stands and everything, and they and he was all the way up, man. He, so my dad had this scar that you know, all the way down, and, and uh, it was lovely, you know. And, but uh, but it was a, it was honestly, uh, it, it it was a scar that was a reminder of that he'd gotten a, a, a second chance, a new yeah. start, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we we have those scars. But we don't do you do you look at those much? You don't really think about them much, but they're there as a reminder, a reminder of where we were but it's not where we are. And so all of us have lives that have been scarred by sin. We've been scarred by failure. Maybe it's our sin, our personal failure. Maybe it's the failure of others. But we've all, we all have those scars. The scars are reminders. They're not definers. Catch that? They're reminders. They're not definers. And so if we look at that, we hold on and we say, you know, listen, I remember the shame of my sin and I remember the hopelessness of a life without Christ and that causes me to glory in my salvation and the hope of eternity all the more. Let's go to the next slide. Hebrews, this is verse 27 through 29. And he says this expression, uh, in, in verse 26 he says, His voice shook the earth at that time, but now he has promised, Yes, once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. He says this expression, yet once more, indicates the removal of what can be shaken. That is, created things, so that what is not shaken might remain. And he says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us hold on to grace. By it, we may serve God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. <laughs> How awesome. How awesome a thought. That no matter how rotten, stinky, no good for nothing, I may have been. I have been washed clean by the blood of Jesus yes. to inherit an unshakable kingdom. Thank you, God. Now, is our world in upheaval and tumult? <laughs> oh, yeah. Does it seem kind of chaotic out there? It could be. But that which is shaken will be shaken. That's why it's important to make sure that we're rooted in the unshakable. The unshakable. I want you to say, listen, we are receiving a, can, a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us hold on to grace. Let us hold on to grace. But what, I want you to notice something. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is a pathway to serve God acceptably with reverence and awe. So you don't have to live terrified of God. Oh, if I mess up, I'm done for. Oh, if I mess up, he's done with me. Oh, if I mess up, I'll lose my salvation. No, no, no. We have that peace of grace. But you know what? That grace compels me. It compels me to say, you know what? I want to serve God acceptably with reverence and awe. With reverence and awe. So let's go to the, the next slide. I think this is the last one. 
We're exchanging a breakable covenant for an unshakable kingdom. If you have to live your life by a set of rules and laws and edicts, if you break one of them, you've broken all of them. By grace, we serve God acceptably. By grace, we serve with reverence and awe. And we don't let familiarity diminish the mighty, awesome, incomprehensible nature and power of God. So what, what God's word tells us to do is exchange that breakable covenant for an unshakable kingdom. Because let's face it, the earth will be shaken. And again, the earth will be shaken. And again, the earth will be shaken. You know what they call World War I right after it was completed? The war to end all wars. The war to end all wars. Wow. I hit it there. No, I did not say that. No. 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 Yeah. The war to end all wars. Now. Twenty years later. It wasn't. Oh, it wasn't even twenty years later, man. They were fighting in uh, Russia two years later. They were fighting in Spain fifteen or twelve years later. You know, there, there was war everywhere. And he said there will be wars and rumors of wars. That's not the message. We exchange that which is shakable and breakable for the unshakable grace of God and his unshakable kingdom. Amen. Serve God honorably with reverence and awe, not out of terror, but out of loving respect and devotion. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings you've given us and the kingdom that you've given us we praise you for uh, we praise you for your pouring out of glory we, we praise you for for your redemption we pray you praise you for the blood of Jesus Lord I pray that we would let go of all those things that that are holding us up and holding us back that we would let go of the heartache and the heartbreak and the failure. And we would plug in to what you want to do in our lives. Lord, help us never lose the wonder of your love. Lord, help us never to take for granted the awesome beauty and power and wonderful extension of grace that you've given us through Jesus Christ. Lord God, let us walk in your grace with reverence and awe. Help us to love you, love one another, and reach out to others. It's in Jesus' name.